without further ado, I am pleased to introduce a wonderful couple, retired attorney, coach, educator, and NFL professional, Hank Bjorklund, and retired attorney and current board of advisors chair for Doctors Without Borders USA, Victoria Bjorklund. Welcome to you both. Uh, Hank in his book has intimately shared about his life through essay, photographs, and poetry. So Victoria, I'll turn it over to you to lead tonight's discussion. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, and thank, thank you, you for inviting thank us. You. Thank you so, so we're gonna jump right in. Hank, you are the author of a book called Head Hits I Remember, My Brain Dysautonomia and Football. So how did you come to write this book? Well, first, let me say that I am dealing with a brain condition. <laughs> so I'm going to answer some of your questions by reading excerpts from my book. Because of my brain, I have had to reinvent myself. And this is how that reinvention, reinvention happened. I am an athlete. Uh, I've always been an athlete and I will die an athlete. I played three years of professional football with the New York Jets and retired voluntarily in my fourth year to attend law school. I took the New York State Bar exam, passed on the first time, Yay. which is <laughs> something I'm very proud of. And I entered the practice of law with an elite New York City law firm, eventually winding up in the uh, headquarters of the Chase Manhattan Bank in the heart of uh, downtown on Wall Street as vice president and legal counsel. And uh, you practiced law at an elite New York City law firm, founded your own department, and became a senior partner. Uh, a brilliant career, I might say. Um, but overall, uh, we enjoyed a pretty wonderful and exciting life together. And over the decades and into our retirements, we used our months of annual vacation time to hike and bike and in many uh, countries, as well as many US states. And we particularly loved uh, preparing for and hiking high altitude treks in the American West, in Canada, in Scandinavia and Europe. So, so how did your illness surface? Well, uh, the first indication was way back in 1993. And you'll remember, well, oh, I, I woke do. up, I, I thought I was going to lose the ability to talk. I was sweating profusely. Uh, I had this sense of profound fatigue. I remember lying in the driveway, uh, you getting me into the car. We rushed to the hospital. Uh, I was in the hospital for a week. Um, I can remember uh, you standing there amazed that they were sticking pins in my left leg and I couldn't feel a thing. Uh, but I eventually recovered. And from that time, they thought it was encephalopathy. They thought it was but some, who knew? some form of encephalop uh, encephalopathy. What's that? Encephalitis or swelling, swelling of, of the, the brain. brain. They really didn't know what, what, or why, why he would have it at that point. What or why. Um, but over the years, uh, I would have these weird episodes where I'd feel uh, profoundly fatigued. Um, blood pressure would skyrocket. Uh, anxiety so acute, I felt like I was going to burst my skin. And of course, these bouts of vertigo. Um, and in 2015, 2016, they became more frequent. So I... Uh, scheduled a doctor's appointment for the afternoon of April 18th, 2016. And to convince myself that uh, all was well, I did an intensive weightlifting routine that morning. And uh, I was on my last set, on my last uh, exercise, when I decided to uh, stretch 10 repetitions. 10 repetitions into 15. Uh, on the very last rep, I felt this profound thud 
throughout my body. I collapsed. The, I was rushed to the hospital, and I, I've never been the same. My health continued to deteriorate, and no one really could tell us what was wrong. There were so many serious, fatal neurodegenerative diseases hypothesized. I couldn't walk upstairs without my blood pressure skyrocketing. I needed a wheelchair because if I stood up, uh, my blood pressure would plummet. Um, I got a scooter because that was the way I could get around and we bought a van to house the scooter. And I thought, how could this be happening to me? I was so health conscious, so fit. But of course it was happening. And uh, we thought I was dying. Victoria got uh, a grief counselor and I fell into deep despair. And I vividly remember the, the day in 2017 when I decided to write about what, what I was experiencing. I woke up in the morning with a sense of urgency and a visceral feeling that I was slipping away. And I had in, an intense desire to document what my life had meant to me or has meant to me. I wanted to leave something of myself behind before it was too late. I wanted to make sense of this unknown condition that had me by the throat. And I wanted to confront my fears and uh, express the profound grief that was roiling within me. So Hank, you began by talking about how you were an athlete, identifying yourself as an athlete. And while you excelled in basketball and softball and track and field um, and other sports, it was really in football. It was football that you played professionally. Can you give the audience a glimpse of what it was like to play professional football with the New York Jets in the 1970s? Here's a picture of you throwing your body around at Princeton, that's stealing home base in yeah, the Hawkins tournament. I knocked the ball out of the catcher's glove. <laughs> that was that was a famous newspaper picture at the I, time. I also stole second and third base. And want to explain that one? I'm jumping. We were on a cruise with Jets and Giants players, and Victoria took this picture of me jumping rope in the cabin. Compulsively working out, Compulsively even on the cruise trip. Out, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's uh, me carrying the ball against the Buffalo Bills. He outgained uh, O.J. Simpson against the Bills. <laughs> uh, yeah, but he wasn't playing. <laughs> no, no, that's I'm true. only kidding. I don't know. Um, we'll see. I see well, day. you will vividly remember that that I game. Do uh, we played the Miami Dolphins in Florida at the Orange Bowl, and. It had to, the temperature had to be in the 90s, but on the field, it was more like 110, mm. that the artificial turf sucked up heat like a vacuum cleaner, and it was literally like playing on concrete. And I remember my feet being uh, so hot, it reminded me of standing in sun-baked sand at the beach. Uh, I had some severe blisters on my feet after the game because of the heat. I don't remember much about the game itself, except this one play where I burst through the line for a short gain, uh, only to encounter a block of granite in the person of all pro, all pro linebacker Nick Bonaconti. Uh, I felt like we were two colliding wrecking balls, and it was a bone-jarring, brain-shaking tackle. I was stunned, I was disoriented, but I would not show it, of course. Uh, I got up as if nothing had happened, just a routine tackle, you know. Um, no effect on me. You never show that it has an effect on, on you, even though you may be dying a little inside, which at that moment I was. And it strikes me, now how uh, oblivious the world outside can be to the intense drama occurring inside the player's brain under that helmet. So that's really important because I think you should tell the audience what we know about what 
uh, happened to our friend Nick Bonaconti and five of his teammates? Well, uh, <clears throat> Nick was one of six members of that Dolphin team who died within 16 months of each other between 2019 and 2020. All six, <clears throat> excuse me, all six were found to have uh, severe CTE. Uh, which can, can only be can you say what CTE is chronic traumatic encephalopathy caused by uh, head hits over a period of time. So some people call it the football disease. Football even disease. It's not just football. Not not at all. Um, I. Uh, so are you I, are you concerned about having a form of CTE? Well, of course, I'm concerned. In fact, uh, there's a group of doctors um, whose expertise is dysautonomia, who surmise that that is what I have, some form of atypical CTE. But I think if you play any sport um, that involves head hits, all football players should be concerned. Soccer players with the heading that they do. Uh, ice hockey players. We've known about CTE for years. They Since called it the 1930s. Yeah, yes. we called it punch drunkenness. So boxers. Mm -hmm. uh, very concerned. Um, and there's a recent study that uh, has identified essentially three factors in causing CTE or increasing your chances of acquiring CTE exponentially. And that is the number of head hits that you receive, sub-concussive head hits, the force of those head hits, and the years over which you experience those head hits. All those factors uh, can lead to CTE. And it can only be determined on autopsy only, at this point in, in life. Right. And I've, I've uh, pledged my brain to the brain, the BY, the BU Brain Bank. Right. Uh, and the Concussion the Legacy The Unite Foundation. Brain Bank run by the Concussion Legacy Foundation and the Veterans Administration. And more than 10,000 people in America, not all football players, have pledged their brains. And we've pledged our brains. Um, and when we're all watching the Women's World Cup soccer game starting Thursday and seeing those women heading the balls, I think we have to be worried about their future health. A lot of the women's soccer players, professionals, have pledged their brains. And women are particularly susceptible because they don't have the musculature that men In have. their necks, that's right. So heading is particularly dangerous. So now let's switch away from from football and talk about uh, more about your brain illness journey and particularly how you've coped with this. Well, um, in November of 2015, uh, I scheduled a stress test because as I indicated before, I wasn't uh, feeling well. I wasn't feeling myself. I get strangely out of breath walking up the stairs and then could go to the health club and do a significant workout, no problem. Uh, I was also uh, experiencing unusual spikes in blood pressure, uh, accompanied by a sense of impending doom. And I was having bouts of vertigo and dizziness. Uh, and I, I wanted the stress test to confirm that. I was the 65-year-old stud I thought myself to be. And during the test, I pushed myself to my absolute maximum of 155 beats a minute. And the supervising cardiologist told me after the test was over, she said, well, you're average. And I was incredulous. I said, average? And she said, yes, for a 20-year-old. <laughs> that was November 2015. Uh, and by April 2016, I'd gone from a, uh, a fitness phenom to barely able to walk upstairs. Uh, and you couldn't walk from the bed to the bathroom. No, it was 
it was a very, very difficult time. Um, my collapse in the gym in April of 2016 was a shock, and it marked the sudden start of my precipitous decline. Um, as you said, I could barely muster the energy or the balance to walk from my bed to the bathroom. Uh, I went from being a model of fitness to being bound to a wheelchair and hiking and running, of course, were, were out. I needed a mobility scooter. Uh, we bought a van to carry the scooter. So I was unable to stand because my my blood pressure would plummet, uh, plummet. If I tried to walk upstairs normally, my blood pressure would skyrocket. Uh, I couldn't do household uh, chores anymore. Couldn't do the dishes. Uh, I couldn't stroll in our gardens. Uh, I couldn't um, manage walking without feeling like I was going to, to faint. And sometimes I had I remember one time, and I know you'll remember, that uh, I couldn't move from a chair for 48 hours because of the vertigo that I was experiencing. And the doctor insisted <laughs> that we go get an MRI to ensure that I hadn't had a stroke. Yeah, I should say we you were in and out of the hospi many hospitals, and we saw over 100 different doctors. So the, the question is, how do you, uh, you know, how do you cope with, 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 uh, this overwhelming grief at the loss of your of your wellness and the anxiety that's so sharp, uh, the anger so intense, I, I felt that it could smother me at times. And uh, the answer, I think, is that you, you don't give up. You, you just persevere for the sake of those that love you, if not for yourself. And the answer is that that you um, find strategies for coping. Which you did. And so now perhaps you can talk about how you took up writing prose and then poetry and then songs as your way of coping with the anger and distress of your illness. And, and maybe you can start by telling us about your most important first poem. Well, the most important poem to me is a poem uh, called Song to a Higher Power, and it became my mantra. I recited it to myself daily, many times, and eventually I came up with a melody, so I would sing it to myself many times. And it started just as a two stanza poem um, that I got the imagery for that poem from a remarkable video that we saw on the summit of uh, Mount Washington in New Hampshire. After of, we had hiked up to Mount Washington. After we had hiked up. Um, but it was a, a ranger standing out in the dead of winter, and he had a thermos of steaming hot coffee. You could see the steam swirling up, and he tried to pour it into a cup. And I say tried because it never reached the cup. Mm -hmm. It it just turned to flakes and blew away. And I thought uh, how wonderful it would be if my troubles, my anger could just blow away like that coffee. So read the poem. Song to a Higher Power. Lord, take my anger, let it pour out from the cup. It's heated to pass to boiling and the steam is swirling up. Let it hit the cold, cold air and turn instantly to flakes. Let it never touch the ground, so no trouble it awakes. Lord, take my hard heart, mold it gently to soft clay. Hold it in your palm, Lord, so it fills with love each day. Never let it harden with resentments or with pains. Keep its life light beating with forgiveness in its veins. Lord, take my fear. Give it wings to fly away. Let it land as hope, Lord, to open each new day. Let your angels hover and breathe upon my cheek. 
keep them here beside me to hold me when I'm weak. Lord, take my doubt, make it dust upon the ground, then cast it to the wind so my faith it can't confound. Never let it pass by the sentries of my heart. Help my faith grow stronger so that all doubt will depart. Lord, take my grief, make it melt like late spring snow, then let the sun shine soft and sweet so summer's light can glow. Wrap me in your arms, Lord, when I feel I can't go on. And if my pain should stagger me, hold me till I'm strong. Well, I've heard you say that and sing it so many times. Since we're on the subject of coping, can you give us some other examples of poems about coping? Could you read some more coping poems from the coping section in your book? Sure. Um, the next poem I'd like to read is called Love Letter. And it's an apologetic love letter to my brain, which I took for granted until so much went wrong. And by showing love for my brain, I'm showing love for myself, which has not always been easy for me to do. Um, I should mention that I've had two FDG PET scans of my brain that show significant lack of glucose uptake. I include a picture in my book. My brain appears mostly black and purple, and it should appear mostly red and yellow. So I had this idea that I'm going to love my brain from black and purple to yellow and red. Love letter. I see your image in my mind, full, firm, beautiful, snug within the protective shell of my care and love. I see you as you should be, not as you are now. Forgive me, my dearest love. I barely gave you a thought. I took you for granted, assumed your fidelity, abused you at times even when you cried for me to stop. When I began to lose you, I thought I was dying. My head, my heart became wild without your taming. My breast held a weight that could break me. How could I have been so blind to all you are to me? I see the beauty of stained glass because of you. Hear the sound of wind brushing pines because of you. Smell the scent of talcum powder on a baby because of you. Feel the touch of a warm and gentle hand because of you. You give me breath and love. All that I am, I owe to you. Without you, I do not exist. Do not leave me, my dear friend, my love, my life. Come back to me fully. Make my body and soul whole again. I will devote myself to making you what you should be. My glucose-rich, fully functioning brain. Uh, we hope for that. Yeah. What's the next one on coping? Getting up. <laughs> um, and, you know, I... I if you feel like getting up, just do one thing that shows you're alive and then do another and another. Uh, so read, the, read your poem. Getting up. They say never give up, but how does one give up? Sometimes I wanna give up. I say, I give up. I try to give up, like the times I curled in a ball. I tried to give up, but I had to pee, so I got up. I got hungry, so I got up. I got curious, so I got up. I felt your love, so I got up. 
It's not that I don't want to give up. It's every time I try, I just can't do it. Instead of giving up, I just keep getting up. <laughs> we have a question from Cynthia, uh, who's interested in how you are doing, Victoria, during this time. How are you doing and how are you feeling? This was so difficult. I, I, I think the way I dealt with it particularly was to focus so much on trying to find solutions, finding transportation solutions, buying the wheelchair, buying the, the mobility scooter, getting the van, researching doctors, researching therapists, taking driving Hank to and from Massachusetts every week for him to have treatment. And of course, just trying to comfort him in the deep grief that he was feeling. I, I continued going to, it, she was actually a widow, widowhood counselor because we thought that Hank was dying. And, you know, so I did go and seek counseling and I just, I just felt it was incumbent upon me to really focus on supporting you through through this and well with, without victoria i I'd, I'd be dust in the ether i i don't know what i would have done and and of course food really cooking wonderful organic Great nutritious cooking. food and um i'm so fortunate but we really hung together uh and and we really hung in there as best we could. We always have. And when Hank started writing, I was very lucky. I was at a caregivers group and the, the nurse asked me, what does your husband, does he have anything he likes to do now that he's so such an invalid? And I said, yes, he likes to write poetry. And the woman sitting next to me, who I believe is on the uh, program today, said, well, I'm the poet laureate of Nassau <laughs> County. And I run a class and I ran after her and said to her, how can I possibly get my husband in your class? So I, that's a practical example of the try, the interventions that I tried to find. And she has been a wonderful mentor. And we are still taking classes with Evelyn Candell. Have for years now. Yeah. So and that really has been wonderful and great encouragement to you. So that's how I've tried to cope. Here's an, your last coping poem, which okay. also tells how we coped. This is called Finally. It had been so long since we'd done it. After my illness, something so natural had become so difficult. We tried several times, but I just couldn't do it. Conversation had once come easily although sometimes we didn't talk at all. Now I was ready to try again. I let the warm water massage my hands. She smiled and gave me an encouraging embrace. I was sure I could last for however long it took. We began unhurried and focused. Leonard Cohen played in the background. When we finished, I stayed standing for a few more sweet moments. That was the first time in months we had washed the dishes together. Such big joy and such small pleasures. Hank always takes it as his responsibility to do the dishes. And he was so distraught that he his blood pressure just couldn't allow him to stand for any period of time. So that was a big moment. And I was so thrilled that that he wrote a poem about it. <laughs> so um, I bet so, you thought we were going someplace. Else. <laughs> so, Hank, after we went through that coping phase, I would say that things started to slowly improve. Right. Uh, and and so then you really worked on self-encouragement. And in your book, that's the next step that you talk about, about coming back to a more normal life. So can you talk a little bit about how you self-encouraged yourself? Well, there, there is healing power in self-encouragement. 
in coaching yourself to in a, in a positive way, in urging yourself to persevere and in exercising tough love when necessary. And in talking to yourself with kindness and understanding, especially when that's not what you're inclined to do. Now, writing poetry, turning them into songs and singing have helped me inspire myself to keep expending the effort to heal. Self-encouragement requires intention and effort. I tend to be very self-critical and I can talk to myself in ways that I wouldn't tolerate from anyone else. I have to choose to be positive. I have to choose to self-soothe. I have to make that choice consciously and keep at it. And with practice, I am becoming a more grateful, accepting individual who strives to live in the present. With my health in jeopardy, I need to facilitate a more profound appreciation of the small miracles of everyday life. Those things I often do not see or hear because I'm distracted. And I've, I've always found it hard to live in the moment, typically focusing on the past and, and the future. And writing helps, helps me uh, to notice and record my appreciation for the beauty of the ordinary. So you started really keeping journals and then moved into poetry to self-encourage yourself. So can you read some of your self-encouragement poems? Sure. Uh, this poem um, is called Prayer for Another Morning. And like many people, I have to kind of relax into sleep. I, I, need, I need it to be cool. I need it to be quiet. I need it to be dark. I need to wear my CPAP <laughs> nose pillow. I need to make sure I'm within six feet of my heart monitor, <laughs> you know, all these things I need to do. And I wrote this short poem to remind myself how grateful I am to wake up in the morning light, no matter how I feel. Prayer for another morning. Dark drapes did not fall flush against the picture window. Morning light coursed through the crack a river from heaven. Pull beaded curtain strings to let the river flood my room, knowing I will swallow suffering for one more glimpse of morning. Yeah, that's a very positive attitude about getting up. Just keep trying. <laughs> so Hank, we, you know, one of the things people say, well, how can I write poetry? Um, we did things like going to Evelyn Candell's class at the Glen Cove Public Library. Then we went to Evelyn's class at the Adult Education Center. We've signed up for poetry lessons and classes um, at Cedarmere, a local historical site. We go to the Seacliff library poet circle. Um, so I think by doing that, we've learned a lot of different formats of poetry that we never knew existed. And Evelyn convinced me that if I was bringing you, driving you to the class, I had to write too. So I know your next poem is in an unusual format. So maybe you could explain this. One. Well, the, this poem was a prompt by Evelyn, From Evelyn to yes. write a letter poem. Right. And uh, a lot of people may not think a letter can be poetic, but well, clearly it, it, it shows that you can write poetry in any format that speaks to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's fun to experiment with different styles and different formats. Yeah. And uh, we had just read uh, portions of a book by a, a wonderful poet by the name of Victoria Chang who wrote a book called Dear Memory that consists largely of exclusively letter of poems, letter poems yeah right? so this is this is titled Dear Dear Fear this is a poem i wrote to my own fear <laughs> dear fear this is what you call a dear john letter yes i am breaking up with you throwing you out on the street changing all the locks 
bolting all the windows and doors. In other words, I'm severing all ties, cutting all connections. I want you out of my life. Oh, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you'll work your way back into the house of my head, just like you've done in the past. But you should know that I found somebody new, somebody who will stand by me. Her name is Courage, and we'll be waiting. Sincerely yours, Hank Bjork. <laughs> I love that one. And what's this I got, one? I got uh, another one here called This Day. And uh, this poem is very important to me. It is inspired by the wind. Uh, I wrote this poem as an expression of gratitude at being alive and able to enjoy the power of nature, even when my brain condition is acute, as it was at the time that I wrote this poem. And it expresses how I try to approach each day with a positive, a positive attitude, an attitude of thanksgiving. Not always successful, but I keep trying. Um, it, this poem celebrates, or the second stanza celebrates the fall. I've all, also written a second stanza that celebrates the spring. That's because you love this poem so much. You want to recite it to yourself around, right. <laughs> around the seasonal cycle. And uh, but, but the interesting thing about this poem is, is, is that it was selected by a producer for morning edition on National Public Radio in celebration of National Poetry Month. And I recited it on air in April of 2021. And it's uh, it's so meaningful to me that I also recorded it as a song. It's called This Day. <clears throat> cool and windy is this day. Whitecaps break across the bay. Sun sparkles on shimmering leaves. Air is fresh on sea-blown breeze. It's early fall. Summer heats over. Old field crops have turned to stover. Scent of change is in the air. Some life is dying without despair. I want to feel my feet in earth. Run so hard my lungs could burst. I want to leap and jump so high. I believe that I can fly. I embrace this day with all my being with open heart and with my face beaming. In this day, I will only thrive. I'm just so grateful to be alive. I love that poem. That's really wonderful. Well, I think that's the end of the prepared readings, but uh, we'll take questions and answers. And I know that um, if you don't mind, I. As we've said, you've worked with two wonderful musicians, Diane Menzel and Helen Kotsky, <laughs> who we met, Diane, at another one of Evelyn's poetry groups. Right. And um, she asked you, could we turn some of these poems into songs? Uh, and you don't write music. You can't read music. And you only sang in the shower. I know. So I have to say, having been married to you for 51 years, it came as a total shock to me that you could write songs, perform songs, and sing them in public. But would you like to take a shot at doing one of the songs, or at least a couple of stanzas? Okay. All I right. <clears throat> Which one is this? I think my... Your voice is breaking a little bit. All right, well, you can do just one or two stanzas if you want. This one is called One More Mile. <clears throat> so it was originally a poem, and then you wrote music for it. Yeah, I, and write, so, writing is uh, a little bit of an You thought it in I, your brain. I and came you, up with, with a... And you recorded it on your, uh, your iPhone, right. and Diane turned it into a transcription, right? Yeah. When your back feels broken and your knees are weak, can you make it one more mile? When your mouth is parched and your lips can't speak, 
Can you make it one more smile when you get the news of another loss and your mind is running wild? Can you calm the storm within your head and rest just for a while? Oh, can you make it one more mile, my friend? Can you make it one more smile? Can you calm the storm within your head and rest just for a while? Now there's a song in prayer that come to mind when all the oceans drown, a rhyme and tune to soothe the soul and silence other sound. No ears you need to hear it now. It plays within your heart. It's in you hear the song and prayer. So let the music start. Oh, you can make it one more mile, my friend. You can make it one more smile. You can calm the storm within your head. It rest just for a while. Oh, you can make it. Mm, you can make it. Mm, you can make it. You can make it. <laughs> <laughs> and I love to see you walking back and forth with your hiking poles, singing this to yourself, telling you you can make it one more mile. And how many miles did you walk today? Back and forth in the house. I don't know. It was uh, I walked for an hour pretty fast. <laughs> So without polls. Oh, without polls today. That means it was a good day. So Jeff, I don't know if we have any questions that we haven't answered, but um, I know that a lot of people want to know, how are you doing now? Well, um, I like to say that I'm not what I was, but I'm doing a lot better than I was. Uh, I, I like to focus on three things. My weekly Zoom with my wonderful neurophysical therapist. Where you do exercise routines. I do with exercise your physical routines, therapist. and then I try to exercise every single day. Right. Um, I have a bi weekly session with my neuro behavioral psychologist. Right. Who, who helps has you been, cope? Who helps me cope. Um, she's been wonderful. I am so fortunate to have them both. Right. She helps you come up with strategies for dealing with your, all the things you've been talking about, the grief at losing your right. physical capacity and to determination stop. to keep going. Right. Sometimes I've got a record that plays in my head and she gives me strategies for uh, turning that off, which has been very helpful, very practical and useful. The third thing is I, I like to folk, uh, try to expand what I call my functional fitness, uh, doing things that I haven't done in a long time. Like the other day, we went to the I went with you to the gross to that grocery to the store, supermarket supermarket that I hadn't been in since I collapsed in the gym, and right. it was a very emotional experience for me. You know, pushing the cart. I needed the cart to, <laughs> yeah. to lean on. It's my balance. Uh, when you when you take this brain into a new environment, I have vestibular issues, but the the same smells were there. the The chicken was in the place. I remember <laughs> it, and uh, so those that that's really helpful. Every once in a while, I'll, I'm not supposed to drive, although that may change. Uh, but every once in a while, I will drive a short distance, which always feels good to do uh, functional things. And of course, I try to do as much around the house. Mm -hmm. I used to be, you know, the like one, the dishes, the yeah. dishes, but also lifting. I'm, I'm you can't lift any. It's strange. Uh, I used to lift. I used to be a weightlifter, you know, and. Uh, uh, I can't lift very heavy objects without having um, a, a significant residual impact that takes me a while to recover. 
So I work with bands with my physical therapist, but weights are a, are a different story. So was the anxiety that you felt uh, unplaced anxiety, or was it that you were anxious over what was happening for you? Well, it was very strange because the anxiety would come on in, in a wave from out of nowhere. And fortunately, there was only one time in the very beginning where I felt an anxiety that affected me physically. Was I anxious about anything in particular? No, it was like a, it was just there. And I felt truly that if I had to have that, that one episode of anxiety that I experienced, if that did not go away, I, don't, I wouldn't know what I would do because it, was, it, it, ha it manifested itself physically in me. Uh, thankfully, it didn't last very long. But... Yeah, I mean, it was it was also anxious about what the hell's happening to me. Am I dying? You know, as a result of the the brain scan I had, um, multiple they, times. Yeah, they think. offered things like supranuclear palsy, multiple multiple system atrophy. These are things that are fatal. You don't recover from them. I mean, I guess you know there you don't recover from CTE either. Uh, but I have improved. I'm able to function a lot better than I than I could. Uh, and so, you know, the one thing that I'm left with is the is the the possibility, the good, strong possibility that this is related to the 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 to my years as a football player. And you know, the studies that they're doing now are able to identify number of head hits uh, by position and the earlier you play the more head hits you get and so these are all subconcussive we're not talking about concussions uh, but they have an in, in, a cumulative effect when i was in high school i started playing when i was nine years old and uh, when i was in high school i played both ways offense and defense i never went off the field uh, College, I played uh, only offense, uh, which was is typical. Um, but the more head hits you get over time, the more likely you are to have uh, um, CTE. So I, it's a concern for anyone that plays contact sports. And the, the answer is to reduce the number. So you got a question from Will about, about your poem, Unlocked From My Head. You write about stopping the spinning in your head. Um, would you talk more about this strategy? How did you... Unlocked From My Head. Is that... <laughs> that was... Um, I'm sorry, Will. I'll have to go. Memories Unlocked? No. Is it the vertigo poem, I wonder? No, it's the one about Madeline. Oh, gosh. All right, well. Yeah. In the meantime, while you're looking for that, is the music out there uh, to be, <laughs> you know, to be <laughs> downloaded or, um, or purchased? Is it like on SoundCloud or one of those? We've just put it on, three of the songs are on SoundCloud. Hank and his two colleagues, Diane Menzel and, and Helen Kotsky, uh, have put it on to SoundCloud. And then they have done a couple of sessions that I think are available on YouTube. Nice. So The poem, uh, page 77. 77, unlocked yes. from my head. That's the one I thought it was. Um, this, this poem was given to me by my uh, psychologist. And given to you? I, I mean, not the poem, but the exercise. I, I've called it three times five. 
I so when I'm unable to kind of free myself from an obsessive thought or some something playing over and over in my head in order to break that uh i i name five things just five things that i see then five things that i feel and five things that uh uh, five things I see, five things I feel, five things I hear. And uh, why five? Because they found that any less and any more. Uh, it's optimal to use. It, five. It's optimal to use five. And for me, that's a simple exercise that that has helped me um, break that chain uh, or that stop that record. Unfortunately, yeah. obsessive compulsive thinking sometimes comes along with traumatic brain injury. Yeah. And other people have it just because it's something they have. But this has been something that she's worked with you on now for these few years. It's wonderful that she specializes in people who've had brain problems. Yes, there have been other exercises she's given me to do, but th this has been for me particularly uh successful um i do it at night if i'm you know thinking about something although five things i see you know <laughs> i i with your eye shades on you i could be seeing a lot yeah. but uh but unlock from my head um yeah. that's the story behind that poem i dedicated it to madeline gittleman who is my therapist and we have a question. Do you see the question from Betsy? I will look it up. Okay. Do you think about your legacy both before and after your collapse? I think your uh, book's your legacy. Well, I, I, you know, when I woke up back in 2017, I, I, I wanted to leave something of myself behind. And uh, I think this book. You should hold up the book. The book is what I've. I'm, it's called Head Hits, I remember. I'm leaving behind. I tried holding it up before and I, I know it doesn't distracted work. everyone. <laughs> <Hold it up. laughs> uh, so. But you wanted to help other people. I and did. I, I, I. Because you, know, you thought you've improved, which is pretty rare for somebody who likely has CTE. They're. they're there was a uh, there's a woman in my in my poetry class. She just had her hundredth birthday, and she had dropped out. She'd been in the poetry class for a long time, but she dropped out and had given up uh, because she was having vision problems. Yeah, writing poetry, and she heard me read my poems at a um, and uh, at a. Great Neck Public Library. Great Neck Public Library. And she came up after me uh, afterwards, uh, or I came over to her because she ushered me over. And she said that based on what she heard from me, she was going to start uh, coming again. And I just, that really moved me. I mean, to have people respond. Uh, if I can help anyone, it's all been worth it i mean to just to persevere for one more hour or just to keep keep going i mean i'm people are out there suffering much worse than i have endured uh and if i can help anybody it's very gratifying thank you both so much uh i one of the main takeaways that i got from this uh session tonight was that there is support out there, so much support out there for everything that's going on, even something that seems so impossible at the time. And you've improved so yes. much. Yeah, I, I have. A lot of what was discussed was in the book uh, that you held up, Head Hits, I Remember, it's available on Amazon.